Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord and I am a consultant psychiatrist based in central London working in private practice. And I'm here at the Royal College of Psychiatrists International Congress 2015 and I'm delighted to have with me now Dr. Lena Palaniapan, who is an associate professor of neuroimaging uh, at the University of Nottingham. He's an associate professor in the neuroimaging unit at the University of Nottingham. And he was part of a panel discussing uh, today at the Royal College of Psychiatrists Annual Congress here in Birmingham, uh, neurostimulation. So first of all, uh, Lena, let me ask you, what is neurostimulation? And in particular, what is repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is your particular area of interest? First of all, thank you for having me, uh, Raj. It's good to be here. The, uh, the idea of stimulating brain using some external force, like electrical force or magnetic force, is a, is a, uh, has a long history. So neurostimulation is simply stimulating your brain using either electrical activity or magnetic activity. And repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, is applying magnetic field in a pulsatile fashion on the surface of your scalp. If you do that using Faraday's principle, the magnetic field will stimulate, will produce electrical activity. And that electrical activity stimulates the neurons on the surface of your cortex. The idea is if you do it repetitively, that is every day for four weeks, for example, that can then alter the properties of the circuits underneath the brain, uh, in, in the brain surface. And these circuits may be malfunctioning in conditions such as depression. So we're trying to make them correct now using TMS. So um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, tell us what it would look like to someone having it. There's a kind of coil, which is a loop, big, a big loop, which is um, an electromagnet. It's got wires in it, and it's connected to quite a big box, which is a machine that generates a powerful current. Is that right? That's right. So you, necess- you, you have essentially two pieces of equipment. One is the generator of magnetic field, which looks like two huge boxes sitting on a table. And then you have um, a figure of eight coil. We call that as a wand. So you can use that wand and place it on the um, surface of the uh, scalp to stimulate. The patient can lie on a couch. They can uh, sit on a chair as well if they want. And uh, the coil usually comes from behind or on the side of their head. So they don't. uh, They can do. um, They can listen to music. They can watch a TV. They can even read a newspaper when the treatment is going on. So they don't need to be anesthetized, and the treatment is painless. Yes, uh, they don't have to have anesthesia and they don't have to stay in hospital. They can uh, drive in, get the treatment and drive out if they can do that. Um, they, um, they, don't, they don't complain of pain generally, but I wouldn't say it's completely painless because one of the common side effects of stimulating the uh, surface of your scalp is the muscles on the surface of the scalp may contract when you stimulate it. And that contraction may, be, may produce discomfort for some people, but it's not a long-standing pain um, like pain that you get when you have an invasive procedure done. Well, I've had it done, and it feels a bit like a small tapping on yes, your head. Yes. And I think one common side effect, when I say common, it's not that common, yeah. is, uh, is a headache afterwards. Yes, that's correct, yeah. So, I mean, in our experience, one out of ten people have headaches uh, when, they, when they undergo TMS. And what you say is right. It's, it's like a stinging uh, effect, a right? tapping effect. And I remember one of our patients who, uh, who just recently completed TMS treatment, um, she describes this as a woodpecker sitting on her head and tapping. And the tapping sensation, um, she became used to it after one or two treatments. Uh, it wasn't bothering her very much afterwards. Um, what would this treatment, or what has this treatment uh, been used for so far in psychiatry? It seems practically everything under the sun in psychiatry uh, people have tried uh, repetitive transcranial medic, medic stimulation with. And um, is there a, are you, do you think there are particular disorders that seem more promising than others as yeah. targets for treatment? Yeah. So yes, you're right. It's been tried for almost everything under the sun, um, just like uh, CBT, for example, um, and many other treatments that we have in early stages. But if you look at the efficacy, the evidence base, carefully, um, the evidence base stands out very well for depression, especially treatment-resistant depression. People who fail at least one or two trials of antidepressants, they seem to do very well with uh, TMS. TMS is also used for neurological conditions, for example, migraine and tinnitus. There's some evidence base building up for it at the moment. But for other psychiatric disorders like OCD, PTSD, people have tried this, but the evidence is really scarce. Now, um, it sounds like you, you would favor it mostly for the treatment of depression. And, and, and how would it compare to CBT or antidepressants um, uh, in terms of efficacy? Yeah. 
So there hasn't been, to my knowledge, there hasn't been studies directly comparing CBT and TMS. That's because the nature of the population you treat with TMS is slightly different from the population you treat with CBT. With TMS, you're looking at treatment-resistant group, people who have failed at least a couple of trials of antidepressants. So th these patients are at a stage when you're looking at ECT, for example, or you're looking at other more invasive treatment procedures. So CBT is not a direct comparator for TMS. In terms of efficacy, uh, one... Um, uh, metric which nicely captures efficacy of treatments is the number needed to treat metric. So if you look at the number of people that you need to treat with active TMS compared to a placebo or a sham TMS to get one person better when they are in a stage of treatment-resistant depression, the number comes to four to five from several meta-analyses synthesized recently in, in 2014. So uh, this, is, this number is very comparable to several antidepressants that we have in practice at the moment. So four or five people to be treated for one person to get better is very impressive, I would say. So basically, the evidence base is it's as good uh, as an antidepressant, but it's very difficult to get hold of um, mm. in Britain today. In other countries, it's slightly easier to get hold of, I think. But in Britain today, particularly in the NHS, it's mm. very difficult to get hold of. So how would someone go about getting TMS yeah. in the NHS? It, it is interesting you say that because TMS was developed in Britain in 1985. Uh, Tony Barker in Sheffield uh, developed the first TMS device to be administering magnetic field to humans. So it's, uh, it's surprising that we haven't picked it up very well in the NHS so far. But things are changing. Uh, evidence base is building. And now there are several centres across the UK where you can get TMS clinically. Uh, our own centre in Nottingham, you can have, we're running a trial. Um, we're also having an observational study. So patients who think they will be suitable for TMS can speak to their psychiatrist and they can uh, get themselves referred to us through their psychiatrist and we can consider their cases. There's also centres in Grimsby and also a centre in Northampton which are offering clinical TMS at present. Uh, to my knowledge, several other places across the country are trying to set up a clinical TMS centre. So in two years' time, I think we'll have more centres than what we have now. What do you think is the mechanism of action? How does it work? Uh, in, in some sense, similar to antidepressants and other treatments like CBT, uh, we don't know the exact mechanism, how exactly it, it relieves of depression, but the best working theory is the understanding that there are some uh, brain regions which are disconnected from each other in, uh, in depression. So this is the disconnectivity theory of depression. If you want to put that connections right, you can either use um, drugs which work on chemicals or you can use psychotherapies which uh, try to uh, improve the plasticity of the brain. TMS does that much more directly. By stimulating repeatedly a brain area, you are improving the plastic property of the brain. So that brain area starts talking or getting connected with the other brain areas in a, in a much better fashion. The, the hypothesis that we work under is there is a, a part of brain, emotional brain, which is called limbic cortex, that for some reason doesn't speak very well with the superior parts of the brain, the cognitive brain, the frontal cortex. So this connection can be improved by TMS. We are applying TMS to the frontal cortex with the hope that it will talk better to the limbic cortex. And we see some evidence already in MR uh, neuroimaging that the connectivity improves with TMS. Yes, but why does the connectivity improve? It's the principle of uh, the more you use something, uh, the, the better the connection becomes. Just like you know, the more you uh, train yourself, the muscles become stronger. So the, the, uh, by electrical stimulation, you are stimulating a part of the brain quite a lot which has been dormant so far. So by increasing that activity-dependent plasticity, you're, you're connecting the two brain regions. This localization point is extremely important, isn't it? I mean, I've administered myself uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, and I was always a bit worried that my neuroanatomy wasn't good enough to get the precise localization. There is a danger, isn't there, in the hands of the wrong person. Mm. They're not actually going to be stimulating the right part of the brain, and all, all you're going to be getting is like a placebo effect. So tell me why the localization is, is very important. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. There's a distinct possibility that people can get the sight wrong and that can produce sometimes untoward effects as well. For example, one of the uh, really bad adverse effects of getting TMS uh, is seizures. You can induce a seizure by repeatedly stimulating brain regions. That happens only, mostly, if you stimulate the motor part of the brain region, the motor cortex. So if you use TMS wrongly for depression, if you start stimulating motor cortex instead of the frontal cortex, which you want to stimulate, you can make a person throw a seizure. So it's very important to have neuroanatomy right. And this may be one of the reasons why uh, TMS, um, TMS treat, uh, early TMS trials did not have very good uh, evidence base. But increasingly, people are getting better in localizing. For example, in, in Nottingham, we use an MRI-based localization. It's a procedure called neuronavigation. So we use an MRI scan 
to locate the brain part that we want to stimulate and then we find a corresponding point on the scalp surface which matches very closely to the brain region we want to stimulate. So this is a real online real-time procedure. This is called neural navigation. So techniques are improving. People are optimizing TMS as we go. Um, so um, I think that's a very, very, very important thing to think about, targeting the right part of the brain. But which part of the brain are you targeting with TMS? So we, in our studies in Nottingham, we generally tol- uh, target left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, that is the uh, outer side of your front of your brain. And the reason why we target that region is because this, is a, this, a, this region is the chair of executive functions. The control that your brain has over other functions of the brain uh, in, is initiated by the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we think in depression, uh, the dorsolateral frontal part of the brain is not speaking very well to the emotional part of the brain. So by improving, by stimulating the dorsolateral prefrontal function, we hope that the connections can be brought back. Um, you mentioned that you can induce seizures. Are there people that transcranial magnetic stimulation is not suitable for? I thought because of the powerful magnet that you, you generate, magnetic field, people who've got like a metal plate in their head uh, shouldn't have it. Yes. Uh, not, not only in the head. We, we generally tend to exclude people who have uh, any metallic implant in the body. Uh, people having pacemakers should not go for TMS. Um, people who have just recently had a stroke, for example, uh, we tend to avoid them in our trials. Um, so neurological conditions which can um, increase your risk of seizures, we generally avoid those patients to, uh, from the TMS trial. Having said that, I have to also say that there are some anecdotal evidences that in patients with intractable seizures, you can use TMS to reduce the frequency of seizures. So it's, it's something uh, that you have to think about. You have to carefully use a pulse sequence in the right place in order to reduce the risks. But if the evidence base is that it's as good as an antidepressant, but not better than an antidepressant, Mm. and there's so much of a palaver to have it done, you've got to have an MRI brain scan, and then the right localization, you've got to go to the right center where they're experts in it, Mm. why bother to have it? Why not just stick to to an old antidepressant? (laughs) That's a good question. Um, So you don't have to have an MRI, so let me correct myself. Having an MRI improves the localization, um, but there are other ways of improving uh, how you localize your uh, targets. So you don't have to have an MRI. You can get it done in in centers where people are reasonably uh, well versed with the neuroanatomy. Um, Why bother is, is, is an important question because the patients who come to TMS trials are not patients who can get better with the one or two trials of antidepressant. They are coming because they have failed these antidepressant treatment trials. Uh, and the whole palaver of getting the treatment, uh, TMS treatment, for them is more tolerable than living with depression. So these are patients who are not able to get any other answers from any other treatments that we have. Those are the kind of patients we treat at the moment. So I think there's a cost-benefit um, analysis to be done for each individual patient. It's not for everyone. So, so if some, someone's listening to this now and they've got depression, um, how would, should they go about thinking whether they're right for transcranial magnetic stimulation and how should they go about trying to get it? The, the first thing to do is to see if you've been, you're, you're getting treatment according to the pathway suggested by bodies like NICE. Are you getting antidepressants um, one class and the second class? Uh, if the treatment fails, you have to have a conversation with your psychiatrist to find out uh, is anything else can be done pharmacologically or using psychotherapy because these are more established than TMS. When you come to a point that these treatments are not working or they're not tol- tolerable for you for some reason, or if you're considering ECT but you don't want to have ECT, for example, then TMS is an alternative for you. It's a second option to ECT for you. TMS is also helpful for patients who have had ECT in the past but are not showing the same degree of response now compared to how they showed in the past. So these are the patients that we would recommend to think about TMS. Lena, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Raj.